Hi guys, back with another video for you today and this is your fragrance questions answered video number five. I've done four of these videos already. I stopped for a long time and as I had mentioned earlier in the year, I'm gonna pick them back up and here it is, number five. These are 12 questions that you guys have sent me and a couple of other things that I'm going to answer as well before I answer your questions. So if you're interested in finding out about these questions, then please stay tuned. Thanks so much for tuning in. This is Sebastian. Yes, today it's your fragrance questions answered number five video. So if you don't know how this works, I answer 12 of your questions in a very long form video. But before we get to those questions, I answer a couple of other things that you guys might have that are not specifically fragrance related. And in this video, I'm also gonna do another quick uh, update of some things I've seen online that I'd like to kind of talk about. So what happens is they're all split up with timestamps so you can read what the question is all about in the info box and click to watch that particular question or you can watch the whole thing as I said this is gonna be a very long video it's skippable you can you know click through the different uh, you know questions and things like that and then weeks later what I'll do is I cut up the the questions and air them separately as individual videos so it might be redundant but uh, some of you guys search for things online and you run across videos so for that specific reason these cut up uh, videos individually are going to be better. So why don't we answer a couple of things uh, first off before I get to the questions and you can skip ahead through these as well if you're not interested in hearing these. So the first thing I wanna talk to you guys about are scammers. There's so much scamming going on on YouTube. I'm sure you guys have heard me talk about it before. Also seen the community tab. There's this uh, Telegram or WhatsApp uh, scam that's going around, uh, impersonators pretending to be me, and not only me, but other channels. In fact, I've had other channels impersonated come to my channel telling or replying to comments of you guys and asking them to contact them. So it's just people are very careless with these scams and they're trying to profit from you know my audience here and of course uh, the audience of other channels. So basically I will never ask you to contact me on WhatsApp or Telegram. There's no chance in hell that I'm going to be asking you to do this. So if you fall for this, you're kind of on your own. Do not give your money to anyone. I am not asking for money. The scammers are. It's never going to be me contacting you and asking you to message me. The only time I'll ask you to message me is if you win a prize. And it's not Telegram, it's not WhatsApp, there's a special email address which I'll ask you to email. Outside of that, you're on your own. Please don't fall for the scam. It's not just happening on this channel, as I said. It's happening a lot of places and I can't control it. Don't ask me, what did I contact you for? What was I asking? I'm not gonna reply to those. I've got so many questions that you guys are sending me, uh, topics and questions to answer about fragrances that I can't keep up with. This adds an extra layer and I just don't have time to reply to everybody. So if you're catching this, please do not, do not fall for the scam. If anybody's in person me or another channel and asking you to contact them on Telegram or WhatsApp, it's a scam. Just delete it, mark it as spam, report it to YouTube so they take down those channels. I don't know what the heck is going on with YouTube and I can't understand why they can't get this solved or resolved. It's been happening for two years. I mean, they've got such technology there with Google and YouTube, they can figure out how people are scamming them with so many different things, but why can't they figure this one out? I don't even get it. But again, do not, do not fall for the scam. It's not me contacting you, it's a scammer asking you for money most likely, and I've heard a lot of people have fallen for it. Okay, the next little bit I wanna talk about before I move on to my own answer to my own question that I discovered and then we'll get to your guys' questions. I've received a lot of comments that apparently my channel does not get a lot of views or you know I don't have a lot of subscribers and things like that and others do. So first of all, I don't really give a crap. I'm here to do what I would like to do and I'm not here to be a celebrity, a fragrance celebrity or actually get a lot of uh, watches and views and uh, subscribers. Uh, I'll do videos on very unknown brands 
and I'll get like two, three thousand views for a video like that. And I'll do some more popular topics and I'll get tens of thousands of views. But I'm in no way here doing this to become a fragrance celebrity. No way. Absolutely not. I am not trying to be Jeremy Fragrance. It's not what it is that I want to accomplish from this channel. I'm not trying to be any of the other YouTubers or influencers or whatever who act like they're celebrities and things like that. That's just not my personality. And I don't really give a crap about that kind of a channel. I don't really watch those channels. I can't really report on them. But please don't come to me and tell me that I don't have a lot of views. I don't give a crap. I'm not talking about everyday fragrances that everybody has access to. I'm talking about things that I like to talk about, fragrances that I like, classics, and then also new underground niche fragrances. I'll, I'll talk about some popular fragrances for sure. But again, I don't, I don't care if my videos don't have views. I don't care if I don't have a lot of subscribers. Uh, I'm fine with the way my channel is and I'll continue that. And if I hear that over and over again, I'm gonna be blocking you. The next thing I'm gonna to talk to you about is something I discovered online recently that I, I wanted to report on myself. And again, this will also be broken up into its own individual video in the future and it'll be searchable on YouTube. But I came across an article recently on Stylecaster and read that Harry's body wash in the fig supposedly is all the rage lately and it smells like rose 31. so i actually decided to buy a bottle of it because um, i'm a fan of harry's i use their razors all the time i actually bought the fig deodorant two years ago uh, from target this is purchased from target i did not care for that i like the smell but it's white and it leaves major white stains under my black undershirts or t-shirts that I wear. So I instantly stopped using it. I had bought three of them. But I circled back to this and bought the, the body wash because I liked the smell. So I wanted to find out about it. But apparently this article on Stylecaster says that people on TikTok are going crazy for this body wash and that it smells like Rose 31. And I was like, oh, I don't remember the fig deodorant smelling like Rose 31. So of course I bought it. And to me, it absolutely no way smells like Rose 31. So Rose 31 is a favorite fragrance of mine. And I don't know where that is. It's right here. Uh, Rose 31 is rose and also cumin spice. And there's vetiver and there's some olibanum and things like that. Absolutely not fruity. Maybe it has some brightness that it might be associated with the fig body wash from uh, Harry's, uh, but it absolutely does not smell like it. To me, it doesn't. I don't know how uh, people associate the Rose 31 with uh, Harry's body wash and fig, but yeah, like I said, they do not smell anything alike. So that's the first thing I wanted to say about this body wash. But on the other hand, the body wash itself is super juicy, fruity, and also a little bit spicy. So I do like the body wash quite a bit. Although when you first smell it, there's a little bit of an off-putting smell in there. It's almost like the plastic has a weird smell. So I don't care for that smell, but when you're using the actual body wash, it's a very f juicy, fruity, uh, you know, body wash. I really like it. It's like around $8. I think it's like eight something. So I, I, I really like it. And it does smell very, very high end. And I like the Harry's brand, as I said, I do like it. And I use their uh, razors for shaving all the time. I'm always buying the cartridges to refill and things like that. And I've had other body washes from them as well that I've had as samples uh, gifted to me from different stores. When you buy things, you get gifts. And I've enjoyed those as well. But this body wash smells super amazing. And I feel like it's perfect for like waking your senses up in the morning because it's so f happy. Uh, and so I, I like that about it. So the other thing I should say is uh, to me, I would have said it's more similar to Tay Noir uh, 29 here. So it's got the brightness of Tay Noir 29 a lot more than Rose 31 um, because obviously Tay Noir 29 is a fig fragrance. So it's a little more in line with uh, the uh, Harry's fig body wash. But I, I would say it's even closer to something like Fico de Amalfi. Fico de Amalfi is a bright, happy, sunshiny, fruity fig fragrance with light green touches and I think it fits a little more closer to the fruitiness of uh, Harry's body wash. But I think there's a couple of other fragrances out there like Hermes en Jardin en Mediterranean. I think that would actually kind of uh, be perfect for it too. It's like if you want to 
use the body wash from Harry's fig body wash use it to you know for the shower that you're doing and then spritz on one of these kind of juicy fruity fig fragrances like the Hermes and Jardin on Mediterranean or the Fico de Amalfi I think they would be a nice uh, complementing uh, process for you like you would shower with the Harry's uh, fig body wash and then apply some of that juicy fruity fig fragrance like Fico de Amalfi or even something like on Jardin on Mediterranean so that's something I just wanted to kind of tell you guys myself uh, I, I, I don't really I started posting on TikTok I haven't really explored it too much so I'm not watching other things so I don't know how uh, blow, how much it's blowing up apparently uh, with this particular uh, body wash um, on TikTok uh, and it's uh, being connected or to uh, to smell like Rose 31. I, I, I personally don't think they smell alike whatsoever. There's absolutely no cumin here. It's also not as dry as Rose 31. Rose 31 is a dry fragrance. This is a lot more wet, juicy as I said. It's juicy fruity so I just don't get that connection but noses are different. Noses I'm still smelling it. Yeah, it's very, very juicy for you. Noses are different. Noses will pick up different things. I don't get the connection myself. And so I wouldn't say that it is uh, similar to Rose 31. And for me, I would have mentioned Tay Noir 29 and even better yet, Fico de Amalfi or Au Jardin on Mediterranean. So that is that little short uh, snippet on Harry's uh, Fig Body Wash. Are you guys fans of this uh, particular product or this line? Do you use their razor blades? Uh, I think they have shaving cream as well, which I don't think I've used. And again, I haven't, I wasn't very happy with the deodorant because it stained my black undershirts. It did smell like the fig, but I just stopped using it because I can't stand white stains under my uh, under arms uh, with my black undershirts but anyway that's that so now on to the questions and the way this is going to work as I said each question is going to be broken down into timestamps you can click on the different questions find the question that you want to watch you can watch the whole thing it's an extra long video and of course within the next two three weeks maybe up to a month these questions will all be broken down into their own videos and they'll air on this channel as individual videos as well you can wait for those to air at the at that time or just watch it here now the whole thing and then watch it again in the future but the first question is this one. So, hi, first of all, I have been watching your YouTube for a long time. So informative and also fun. Recently, I had Tonka 25 Lelabo and leftover smell. Two to three hours later, from skin is very stinky, dirty, smells like dirty, not washed body. After workout, as I checked their websites, they said animalic musk but I also have musk from Frederick Ma. It is not like musk from this. Smell from Tonka 25 is more like Le Labo 13. I see that most animalic smell categorized as musk but can you clarify what smell it is? Is it civet or ambrette? So that is an interesting question and I've always wondered about Tonka 25. It does have a sweatiness about it. It definitely does. Uh, so I associate this kind of musky sweatiness that's uh, in this particular fragrance to almost being like castorium to me, maybe a bit like civet-like. Uh, they mention musks that are featured in this uh, fragrance, but they don't really mention what kind of musks. But the Le Labo website does say sweat or um, warm skin. Uh, so from the Le Labo website, this one is dark, a good addictive warm dark as if the humid summer underwoods, their seeds and resins were sprinkled with layers of musks and sweetened with drops of vanilla. It evokes the smell of warm skin and resinous wood. The perfumer's notes say orange flower absolute, the unique cedar atlas, styrax resins, absolute of tonka and musks. We say tonka 25. So that's what the Lelabo website says for the description of this particular fragrance and I can totally get that warm skin. Warm skin refers to sweaty uh, so I can totally associate that with this Tonka 25. For me this Tonka fragrance is nothing like Feb Delicious or Boadi, uh, Boadi uh, the Van Cleef and Arpel um, Tonka fragrance. There's a, so many Tonka fragrances out there that go into the gourmand direction uh, or woody direction even but not sweaty like this and for me that's what's uh, making uh, the fragrance uh, become kind of stinky is what this person is saying and I feel like once that kind of um, warm body uh, you know quality kind of appears on you and if you have 
also sweated, I think it contributes to creating kind of this funk. I've noticed this with this particular fragrance quite a bit and I don't reach for it too much. And personally, I wouldn't wear this fragrance when it's hot outside, humid outside. That's when you're going to experience this very much like that. But a couple of things this uh, person also said, another 13, they connected uh, Tonka 25 to another 13. I don't get that sweatiness from another 13. I feel like another 13 is very clean. It's a clean fragrance, but it does have clean musks in there as well. I believe it has ISOE Super, which is cedarwood, a little bit sandalwood, and it also has Ambroxan, which is supposed to be like ambergris, kind of ambery, woody, uh, dusty, musky, and a bit salty, uh, marine, kind of like ambergris. But I don't get this sweatiness from that one. I do get it from this one and I feel like it's the musks that are in here that are creating this. They've also asked about ambrette. Ambrette seeds are maybe contributing to uh, creating that kind of funk as well. There's no mention of uh, ambrette seeds in this on the Le Labo website. So maybe there is some, and sometimes ambrette seeds can create this kind of a sweaty feel, and sweaty meaning like a, an unwashed body feel, but for me, with ambrette, it kind of um, distantly related to iris, so it has this powderiness, and it also has a bit of ve vegetal touch, light fruitiness as well, and some even light booziness there as well, but definitely very powdery, and it can get a little sweaty, so it definitely has a bit of funk there. But for me, I feel like they're using synthetic musks, more like synthetic deer musk, maybe a bit like castorium, and maybe even like civet like I haven't gotten to a stage with Tonka 25 on my body to smell like it's be using civet, so it doesn't have that kind of like fecally kind of uh, dirty animalics there, but uh, definitely the sweatiness is there for sure. I would agree with that, and I think uh, it's definitely uh, prominent in this particular fragrance. So if you are a fan of Tonka 25 and you do wear it in the heat, does that happen with you? Does it get like a sweaty vibe, like a warm skin? So that uh, totally uh, makes total sense that uh, this particular person is saying that it's you know, kind of um, acting very stinky. The other thing I want to say, they mentioned a musk ravageur. They're completely different musks. For me, uh, musk ravageur from uh, Frederick Mall used to be a little dirtier, but I feel like, as I've always mentioned, under Estee Lauder, it has gotten a little more gourmand. So I think because of the gourmand notes and the spices that are in there and the aromatics, it kind of like hides the animalics. So it doesn't appear as much. With this one, it's a little more it's a little more, uh, not simplistic, but not overwhelming with notes. So I feel like the musks are more in your face. Uh, there's also the mention of musks, not just one musk. Whereas with the uh, Frederick Mall, the musk ravageur, I'm assuming it's just one kind of musk. Uh, it could be a couple of musks, but for me, I feel like the musks in uh, Tonka 25 are a lot more in your face. And with uh, the musk ravageur, it's definitely uh, a lot less and more gourmand. So those are my thoughts on Tonka 25. Let me know your thoughts on Tonka 25. Do you experience this as well? Does it kind of um, give you the dirty, stinky kind of animalic vibes that uh, this person is getting? Uh, do let me know, put a comment down below, below so we can all find out uh, what kind of experience you have with this. But I should just wrap up by saying Tonka 25 is definitely not a gourmand Tonka fragrance. It's more of a musky fragrance for sure. Definitely in your face, uh, musky, kind of a sweaty uh, skin uh, type of an experience. So Tonka 25, and that is the first question for you guys. All right, question number two comes from Katarina. Hi Sebastian, I discovered your channel only a few months ago, but I'm officially obsessed and my fragrance budget has dramatically increased in the meanwhile. Your passion and love for fragrances comes through the screen and your ability to describe scents is absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much for the work you put in these videos. They make my day. I watched a video in which you described how you got into perfumes and I could see myself in some of your memories. I'm Italian. I love the fragrances of the 80s and 90s. To me, a fragrance should reflect one's personality and my personality is not a whisper, so my fragrance shouldn't be either. I used to wear Fiji and Maggi Noir back then, which weren't really age appropriate, but I want to believe I pulled them off. I have a question for you. I'm a fan of feminine classic fragrances. I've been using Dior's New Look 1947, which I love, but I'm disappointed by its performance. Since you have such an encyclopedic knowledge of fragrances, Fragrances, could you recommend similar fragrances? Not necessarily new as long as it's still in production, but possibly stronger and more persistent. Again, thank you very much for your channel. You're the much needed escape during these times. All the best, Katarina. So that is a, a request for alternatives to uh, New Look 1947 from Dior. 
Here's a bottle that I've had for a while. It's kind of getting really, really low. This is the version before they re-released a collection in 2018, I believe. It's a amber floral, which is what I would uh, call this particular style. And it features lots of flowers with ambery notes, vanillic resinous touches. So it features jasmine, benzoin, vanilla, ylang ylang, tuberose, rose, among many other notes in this particular fragrance. I do enjoy this fragrance. It's a nice warm fragrance with that kind of freshness from the flowers so it's a nice contrast to the fresh floral smells of all the different flowers in here to the warmth of the vanilla and the benzoin which creates the ambery touches that's why it's called an amber floral so she's asking for some classics and I personally would not recommend classics because a lot of the classics if you are gonna get their current formulations they're gonna be pretty um, watered down just like Dior 19, New Look 1947 uh, it's from a designer, it's the current release, but she's having a problem um, uh, with its performance. So I'm going to go right to some more uh, modern uh, alternatives for this. They're not going to be identical, but they're definitely amber floral fragrances. We're going to start off with Panuja's uh, Datura Amaretti from their Mathieu Libre collection of fragrances. This is an amber floral fragrance, and it's quite delicious. It features almonds, it's got Datura flower, biscuit accord, cherries, ylang ylang, so kind of sort of similar notes but then again not really. Datura flower is a very unique and distinct smell which is captured here perfectly and then of course you've got that ylang ylang which is also present in the new look 1947 but this one also has cherry so it's a bit fruitiness and then of course it's got, it's got that biscuit accord. There are some more ambery notes in this particular fragrance as well some vanillic touches but it's definitely I would call it a gourmand floral but an amber floral for sure. It's definitely got the ambery touches and I feel like this is definitely much much more longer lasting in general to something like Dior New Look 1947. It's also pretty modern and again these fragrances I'm going to recommend here in this video uh, in this question uh, are going to be definitely more modern uh, fragrances as an alternative to New Look 1947 and they're not identical again they're just kind of the similar style of amber floral fragrances that I would think that would make great alternatives to Dior New Look 1947. The next recommendation as an alternative for Dior's New Look 1947 will be Tannis Tabac from Nila Fardunil. This is a fairly inexpensive fragrance. It's got that beautiful tobacco blossom with the Egyptian jasmine. There's also Casablanca lily. Uh, so it's a floral balm in general, but it also has some light dirtiness from the, the tobacco-ish touches in here. And of course, very much woods and lots of amber with this one. So there's definitely a warmth, contrast with the freshness. Definitely very feminine, but I think a man can totally pull this one off. And it smells fantastic, I think, if you like the idea of a tobacco blossom, something a little different with the jasmine and the lily. The lily is definitely really, really prominent in here. You'll definitely notice it, but as I said, it eventually becomes ambery warm and a bit spicy as it's drying down. Some light dirtiness, as I said, as well. So Nilafar Tannis, it's actually Nilafar Dunil Tannis Tabak. So another one that I would recommend is uh, Ilang in Gold by M. Mikolov. This is definitely a beautiful Ilang Ilang warmth up, warmed up with the vanilla and coconut. It's definitely very, very musky as well. And it's got sandalwood and fruity notes, but definitely the Ilang Ilang is really, really prominent here. For me, Ilang Ilang has a kind of a uh, beachy, solar kind of um, banana-ish uh, vibe when I smell it. So here, it takes on a kind of a gourmand characteristic because it also has coconut and it also has that vanilla. So it's definitely a great, um, you know, alternative for uh, the Dior New Look 1947. If you guys don't know that one, do check it out. Uh, something really, really intense is Borea from the house of Tiziana Terenzi. And all their fragrances are very, very, uh, you know, long-lasting, they're extra to parfum concentration, and this one, once again, is a definitely a great amber floral fragrance. This one also has fruitiness, it also has kind of a beachy coconutty vibe, and then also nuttiness as well, so it's kind of a very unique uh, experience, but lots of flowers, and definitely an ambery touch. Uh, it dries down to kind of an amber woody uh, thing here. So it's Borea from Tiziana Terenzi. And then uh, we've got uh, the House of uh, the Spirit of Dubai with Turath. Oh man, this is such a delicious fragrance. 
I don't know if you guys know this one. Also very, very complex, layers and layers and layers of notes. It wears very, very complex, very, very long lasting. There's dried fruits here, oud rose, strawberry, apples, peaches, additional fruits and amber and spices and vanillic touches. It's just a really, really complex, beautiful amber floral fragrance and also fruity as well. Definitely we've got fruity touches and also a bit of gourmand touches as well. So this is a great, great fragrance. This is Turath from the Spirit of Dubai. And one of my favorite amouages, I would consider this as uh, an amber floral fragrance. It's kind of a gourmand lilac fragrance. It's Lilac Love from Amouage. Really delicious. Really, really yummy. The lilac and the cacao in here kind of really work wonderfully together. And it's not chocolatey, it's more cacao. You're actually wearing the sprinklings of cacao on lilacs kind of a thing, you know? But there's also heliotrope here, gardenia, tonka beans, vanilla, orris. It's a yummy fragrance, definitely recommend it. I highly recommend this one. This is my favorite feminine fragrance in the um, Amouage collection. So that is Lilac Love. And then we've got Zerjoff's 400. This is a really yummy fragrance. Fragrance. And again, this is also tobacco, kind of a tobacco blossomy kind of a fragrance. They don't really credit the the um, the notes for uh, this collection, which is Join the Club from uh, Zerjoff. But I do get kind of a tobacco floral, tobacco kind of a thing, a bit of dirtiness. But this one also has honey, it has vanilla orange blossom, bitter orange, ylang ylang. So it's definitely one of the great, great alternatives for something like Dior's New Look 1947. Uh, this is definitely Zerjoff-esque and also uh, it's really great with the tobacco, the white tobacco in here. So this is Zerjoff 400. A couple more, we've got uh, uh, 100 Silent Ways from Nishane. Really beautiful fragrance, really, really wonderful, very long lasting. Beautiful vanilla gardenia tuberose combo with sandalwood and there's a bit of fruitiness there with peach. Smells fantastic. Great on its own, layers perfectly with Hachivat as well. This is 100 Silent Ways. And then the last fragrance from an indie house called Frederico Parfums. This is Blooming Amber, this one right here. And it's a great modern indie niche fragrance that is the amber floral style. It features amber, musk, honey, lily of the valley, jasmine, neroli, vanilla, cashmere. A lot of things happening here. There's some citruses, some aromatics, some spices, but a beautiful, very, very beautiful uh, amber floral fragrance. So that is Blooming Amber from Frederico Parfums. And hopefully that answers uh, the question that um, she had about uh, alternatives for New Look 1947, uh, fragrances that are definitely longer lasting than New Look 1947. And I'm sorry I didn't have any options that are classic. I just feel like classic fragrances have just been watered down too much. They're under conglomerates that just don't really want to keep the fragrances as their own. And these are, you know, there's definitely smaller houses, not the big ones that are under a conglomerate, so they keep their fragrances pretty consistent, I think. All right, question number three comes in from Jeffrey Edwards. Hello, Sebastian, hope you are doing great. Listen, I recently discovered a Dior scent no one talks about and wanted to ask your advice on what you think of it. It's Gris Dior, but I think it was called Gris Montaigne before. I love this one as it's rose and patchouli with oak moss. It's quite masculine to me while being a bit feminine as well, but I enjoy wearing it as my signature scent. What are your thoughts on Dior Gris? Sincerely, your longtime subscriber, Jeffrey Edwards. So thanks for that question, Jeffrey Edwards. Yes, Gris Dior used to be called Gris Montaigne before, and they changed the name in 2017, I believe. I started noticing the name change when Saks Fifth Avenue here in San Francisco actually got the Dior Privé collection and added it there, later lost it a year or two years later and went uh, exclusively to Neiman Marcus again. Uh, I wasn't a fan of it until I actually really dug into it because there were fragrances in this collection that I really enjoyed and for some reason I just kind of like ignored uh, Green Montagna and then later becoming uh, Gris Dior. So the, originally it was launched in 2013 and it became Gris Dior in 2017 and I have a bottle here uh, and I recently featured it in my Rose Chipre fragrances video. This is actually a Chipre. It's a modern Chipre and I'm not sure how much oak moss they're using in here. It's supposedly in here. I kind of do smell that kind of earthiness that oak moss has, but lots of rose as well. And there's also patchouli here with a big dosage of bergamot. There's definitely the juicy citrusy touches here. And of course there's some uh, cedar, amber, and sandalwood as well. For me, I feel like it's definitely a solid release, but I think for some noses this might actually uh, scream uh, classic because it is a Chipre and a lot of folks consider Chipre fragrances classics. I mean. 
it's kind of in the same uh, ballpark of something like Portrait of a Lady, which, which is also a Rose Shepra. But then again, that also screams classic and also feminine. And I've had comments come in a lot for that fragrance, associating it with grandmas, older people, and things like that. I guess a lot of people that don't understand Shepra fragrances would associate them to be classic or, or tired or older demographic kind of fragrances. So I feel like this would also kind of be associated with that, that kind of a style, but I'm not 100% sure. It's not as spicy. It's not as spicy spicy and uh, warm spicy like Portrait of a Lady is. It's definitely a lot more citrusy here. Definitely the prominence of the citruses is there, but in the end it is oak moss, it is patchouli, and it's a lot of rose. And this combination is very classic and that's how cheaper fragrances were. Although cheaper fragrances rely on bergamot uh, for top notes, uh, labdanum for heart notes, and oak moss in the base notes, and the rose and patchouli were extra additions, uh, generally they were not there and they were there kind of a thing. Here I feel like this is definitely a full-on uh, kind of a classic modern take on a cheaper fragrance, but I, I enjoy it. I, I like its smell. It does have decent longevity. It's not a screamer, although when you first spray probably within the half hour, half hour to an hour, it does have a nice massive projection for this particular fragrance. But in the end, just like all other uh, Dior uh, Privé collection fragrances, they are not really like big in your face uh, beast mode fragrances. It's a designer after all. It just has a very unique smell. It's a unique smelling fragrance, which is what I usually look for and then I decide if I really want a fragrance because of the smell and how unique it is or if I want a fragrance because of its performance because none of the fragrances from uh, Dior, Privé or even any designer fragrances from Signature line to um, you know their private collections they're not like the biggest beast mode fragrances. I mean there are the rare exceptions like Dior Homme Parfum from Dior does have a lot of beast mode touches uh, and maybe even Sauvage Elixir um, but uh, not necessarily everything that they launch are extremely intense and th this being an example of it. But for me, it has great lingering power and the kind of notes they're using here, even though it doesn't scream too much, it does have that lingering power. So if you like the idea of rose, a rose cheaper, oak mossy kind of touches, earthy touches for sure, green woody, earthy, spicy touches, this is definitely a solid release. I'm glad they kept it. I did enjoy Green Montagna a little more. I think Green Montagna had a little more association with uh, something to do with Dior and I don't know what uh, triggered the name change. Perhaps Gris Dior is a lot easier to say than Montagna which basically means Grey Mountain I believe and this is Grey Dior basically what it stands for but yeah I think it's a solid release um, definitely deserves to be talked about or spoken about not many people talk about it I enjoy it it's not one of my all-time loves it was also a later discovery as I said it was not one of the ones I gravitated towards when I first discovered this collection in uh, 2012 although when I first discovered it this wasn't even launched yet it launched in 2013 as Gris Montagna but still I kept going back to like Leather Oud meets uh, uh, Bois d'Argent, uh, Vetiver, and some of their other fragrances. And then later on, like 2016, 2017, this started uh, really kind of coming into focus for me and, and enjoying it. So anyway, uh, Jeffrey Edwards, yeah, I, I agree. This is a great scent, uh, definitely deserves to be spoken about. And let me know you from you guys, are you a fan of Gris Dior? Do you enjoy this particular fragrance? Do you enjoy cheaper fragrances? Do you like the Dior Privé collection? I should say this is uh, 250 ml for 450. Prices have gone up. When I first caught into this game, these were like the higher price of $200. Uh, it's not $450. And I feel like a lot of fragrance prices are really going way, way up. But is this $450 for 250 ml? 125 ml is 330, so it's better deal to pay 120 more to get 125 more milliliter. Or if you want a, a 40 ml, it's $125. So it is kind of on the pricey side. And when you think about that, maybe it might not even be worth getting Dior Privé fragrances and going to a uh, like a more niche fragrance where you know the performance is going to be but I haven't smelled anything like this in the niche world I haven't although there's a ton of uh, rose sheepers out there but none of them smell like that anyway that I hope answers your question and if you guys are watching let me know if you're a fan of a greedy or
Okay, next question comes from Amna. Dear Sebastian, if you had to choose between Missio or Niseon, which one would you choose? Thanks a million, Amna. So Amna is basically talking about Missio from the house of Frederick Mob, created by Bruno Jovanovic, and then of course Niseon from the house of um, Parfums of Marley. So these two are both kind of very ambery patchouli fragrances. If I had to be honest, honest, and I'm a big, big fan of Parfums of Marley, I would go with Niseon over Missio hands down. I don't know, something about uh, Missio from the House of Frederick Mall, there's a, definitely a r roughness about it and a very greasy characteristic about the patchouli or the, the notes they use in here that kind of turns me off a bit even though I enjoy the fragrance. But if I had to pick between the two, definitely Nisean for its really ambery touches where it doesn't come off kind of greasy. But the Missio fragrance was a 2015 launch. It was supposed to be the, the masculine answer to Portrait of a Lady. Uh, I don't really necessarily think they, they should have done that. They should have just launched it as a unisex offering. But it features notes of patchouli, incense, rum, cedar, clementine, amber, musk, and vanilla. But for me, definitely, it's patchouli for sure. The patchouli is definitely on the medicinal side. Light booziness comes in, lots of wood, definitely citrusy touches of course and an overdose of amber and vanilla in the dry down with musk but when I'm wearing it I'm, I'm a put off a little bit by it I'm not 100% in love with it I love patchouli but this particular patchouli is a bit off-putting because of its greasy oiliness I feel like it's patchouli in a manufacturing plant where you're working inside of a car interior that has been running for years and years. You've kind of like dig into it. It's all the grease, the oil and everything there. And a lot of patchouli together is what you're smelling. That's what this one smells like. And you know, like I said, I like it and uh, I don't love it. But here, Niseon on the other hand is a very underrated Parfums of Marley fragrance, which came out in 2016. I don't know if Parfums of Marley tried to copy uh, Frederick Malls Missio, I doubt it. Although they kind of do have similarities, but for me, I love the patchouli in Niseon a lot more than I love the patchouli in Missio. And the notes for Niseon are woods, patchouli, saffron, labdanum, pink pepper, floral notes, olibanum. For me, it's a lot smoother. It's, it's very much in line with uh, being kind of a similar style to Missio, but it's much smoother and it's also sweeter and you definitely don't have that kind of greasy car interior oiliness that I get from the uh, Frederick Mall Missio. So I don't I don't consider Frederick Mall's Missio a failure. It's just, you know, there's not there's fragrances that you really love and there's fragrances that you don't really love too much, but you like. And for me, Missio is a like, whereas a Niseon is definitely a love but I don't talk about it much. I don't know why. I forget about this one because it's kind of in the shadows of all the other Parfums and Marley fragrances, but I really do enjoy the kind of ambery touches against the very kind of earthy uh, patchouli. And here with Niseon, and even though I don't get an overdose of the chocolate cakiness that I get with a lot of patchouli fragrances like Psychedelic or Reminiscence and uh, some other ones, there's definitely an undertone of chocolatiness here, which I don't get at all with Missio from Frederick Mall whatsoever. So again, if I was to pick between these two, uh, I like Frederick Mall's Missio. I, I love Niseon by Parfums Marley. So I would hands on go with uh, Niseon over uh, Frederick Mall's Missio. What do you guys think? Which one do you prefer uh, between these two fragrances? Uh, let me know, put a comment down below. All right, question number five. Sebastian, please compare Chanel Coromandel with Zerjoff Richwood. What are the similarities and what are the differences? This is one question that I received via Instagram and I forgot the user's name. And also I received multiple questions on YouTube as comments asking me the comparison of these two fragrances. And yes, I do find similarities between the, these two fragrances, I feel like like uh, Zerzhov's Richwood is definitely a great alternative uh, for Coromandel if you're looking for a more of a medicinal take on Coromandel. So I have Coromandel in the EDP concentration which launched in 2016 but the EDT was launched in 2007 and I've been a fan of it since then. Uh, I don't have the EDT currently unfortunately but the EDP does it for me and it's a combination of patchouli, frankincense and benzoin but a lot of people associate the kind of creaminess in here kind of with the white chocolate and I've always mentioned that there's definitely a chocolate cakey touch with patchouli anyway so I feel like in this case it's more of a white chocolate creaminess and I feel like that's created or from the usage of the benzoin note in here which is a vanillic kind of resin sweet and 
this is a great smell. It's a wonderful fragrance. It's one of my favorites from Chanel. I would think this would be like number two uh, after Le Lyon. Uh, really love the uh, combination of uh, notes here. But for me, uh, the prices have gone up with this particular house uh, and their fragrances. And currently a 200 ml in this uh, large size is $425 and a 75 ml is $275. Of course, there's tax added to those as well, but still it's a fantastic smell. But with uh, Zerzhov's uh, Richwood, on the other hand, they are similar for sure. It was launched in 2010, so three years after the EDT came out of uh, Coromandel from Chanel, and it features notes of patchouli, sandalwood, vanilla, rose, musk, geranium, cassis. And there's a lot of things happening in here. There's light rosiness, um, floral touches. There's definitely fruitiness there. And for sure, the sandalwood uh, variety in here, I feel like, meshed with the patchouli, they contribute to creating a more medicinal touch. It doesn't have that sweetness, like white chocolatey touch that uh, Coro Mandel has from Chanel. So it's a toss up between which one, which one I would go with. I really love Chanel Coromandel, but I also really love Richwood. So they're both really amazing patchouli fragrances. But in the end, when I'm in the mood for something sweeter, I would go with the Coromandel. If I'm in the mood for something a little more luxurious, a little more medicinal, I would go with Richwood. And the prices for this fragrance, 50 ml is $450. So it's a lot more expensive than the Chanel. But you guys know about Chanel and their fragrance as being not the best performing. I get decent performance from Coromandel and the EDP. Once again, just like uh, the Dior I spoke about, Gris Dior, it's a designer. Uh, it's not going to be the beastliest fragrance and uh, I, I get kind of very moderate performance, but it has patchouli in it. Patchouli has lingering power. So, But with the Richwood, uh, $450 for a 50 ml. There is a 100 ml. I could not find a suggested retail price, but on the Zerzhov website, it's 570 euros. Really, really pricey, really expensive, but I do get better performance with the Zerzhov in comparison to the Chanel. I, I like both of them. I can't pick between the two. It's just for me, it's just, it just smells more medicinal and not necessarily as inviting and cozy as Cora Mandel gets with its creaminess. So does that make sense to you guys? That's the sweetness is much more prominent in Cora Mandel. And because of the, the types of patchouli they're using here in Richwood or the sandalwood, I feel like it smells like a medicinal sandalwood note in here uh, and contrasted with uh, the patchouli. But you know, I think the contribution also comes in from the geranium or some of the other notes that are in Richwood perhaps to amplify that kind of medicinal touch but I'll just say it again both of them are great depending on the mood I'm in for I would go with that particular fragrance but what about you guys have you compared these two fragrances which do you prefer Coromandel or Richwood which one do you guys get better performance from let me know put a comment down so we can all find out all right question number six comes from Simone dear Sebastian I need your help I can buy only one fragrance between Louis Vuitton afternoon swim and Le Labo Bergamot 22 which one do you suggest will you come in Italy for the next Exxons. Thank you. Wishes from Milan. Simone. Yes, I'll be coming to Milan in March, end of March, early February for Exxons. If you are coming, uh, hit me up, let me know. We can connect there. Interested in checking out a new fragrances in Milan, but in regards to the question, which one I would pick between Afternoon Swim or Bergamot 22? Can you guys guess? Which one have I featured at number one a lot more than Afternoon Swim? So I would go with Bergamot 22 as my option between the two. I really, really love the way Bergamot 22 smells in comparison to Afternoon Swim, even though I really enjoy Afternoon Swim as well. I think it's a great mandarin orange fragrance. For me, Bergamot 22 is very magical. It really, really does a good job at paying tribute to this beautiful fruit, Bergamot that's used in a lot of fragrances over and over and over again. If you've noticed any kind of a notes breakdown for fragrances, you'll most likely see bergamot up top. It's always there. It's beautiful, it's juicy, it's sweet tart, it's a bit floral, and I feel like it complements flowers very well if you're using it uh, in, you know, to, to add with uh, floral fragrances, or any fragrances especially, because it's a great, sort of non-distinct uh, you know, fruit, uh, a citrus fruit, uh, that there's a, I think it's a prized fruit, and I think it's a perfumer's uh, dream note to start things off in a fragrance when they create it. So, in regards to afternoon 
Swim. Let's look, look at the prices. 100 ml of Louis Vuitton's Afternoon Swim is $300. Prices have gone way up. When Louis Vuitton first introduced their fragrances, they were $240. Now it's 100 ml for uh, $60 more, $300. So 200 ml, this size is $430. Really, really pricey, extremely pricey. In, re in the other hand, 100 ml for Bergamot 22 is 310. They're both refillable and I don't have the refill prices uh, on hand. So the Le Labo prices have gone way up as well and this is $10 more than the Afternoon Swim but still I would go with the Bergamot 22 in comparison to Afternoon Swim. They don't have a 200 ml bottle like this at Le Labo. They have a 500 ml, kind of like a, a Tom Ford flacon but it's more uh, it's more like a laboratory bottle jar and that goes for 500 ml goes for $1,055 so it's not sprayable like this so you'll have to buy an additional atomizer according to my uh, last time I checked with an associate at San Francisco Le Labo Boutique, they mentioned the 500 ml does not come with an atomizer. You'll have to figure the atomizing or spraying, spritzing of it on your own. So why would I pick Bergamot 22? I pretty much have answered it. Both of these are really, really great fragrances. I like that Afternoon Swim is a little sweet, but I always associate citruses with a little tartness, and I get that with Bergamot 22. It has the tartness, it has the floral touches, it has the greenness, it it has the juiciness, sweetness, everything is there. It's a nice, nice balance. It, it's one of my favorite citruses, and I don't think I can ever live without a Bergamot 22. But with Afternoon Swim, I can live without it. I like it. I love it, in fact. But I love Bergamot 22 a lot more. The differences are with notes. We've got Mandarin Orange, Sicilian Orange, Bergamot, Ginger, Ambergris for Afternoon Swim. Yeah, it's got a watery touch, and I feel like the Ambergris adds that kind of layer, a little light, very, very faint marine thing happening in here but you do experience that zing it's not an overwhelming zing um, for me afternoon seem afternoon swim seems a lot more balanced uh, not a lot of highs and lows with bergamot 22 you do have some highs and lows so it just feels a little more linear with afternoon swim in comparison to bergamot 22 where you'll have these like sharp edges which I kind of like because it puts me in an adventure in comparison to just experiencing the fragrance you know linearly if that makes sense but either way bergamot 22 hands down wins the fight if I were you and you haven't purchased your fragrance yet uh, definitely go with bergamot 22 as i said it's only ten dollars more here in the states but you're in italy these fragrances are a lot less for you there than they are here for us so it's a better value for you there i don't know the price differences currently but um, again bergamot 22 is uh, the fragrance i would go with hopefully that answers your question and guys what do you think which one would you go with which one do you prefer afternoon swim or bergamot 22 let me know put a comment down all right moving on to question seven another question about musks Hello, Sebastian. I only like musk perfumes, and you know a lot about that topic. I would like to know which one, Mono Scent G or Magnetic Blend 7, is better to use alone or to bust other perfumes. I believe she means to boost other perfumes. Which is a cleaner musk and stronger? I like white flower musk perfumes and woody ones. I use Narciso Rodriguez Pure Musk, which I'm not too familiar with. Tom Ford White Suede, I do know and enjoy. And for warm weather, Bulgari White Tea and Body Shop White Musk. If you can remember of a better musky clean perfume like these, tell me please. But first, I would like to know which is better as a just musk perfume, Monoscent G or Magnetic Blend 7. I don't like vanilla or amber. Thank you for your time. Best regards from Portugal, Francisca. Okay, if you don't know which fragrance is Francisca, guy is talking about. She is referring to Magnetic Blend 7 from Initio Parfums and Monoscent G here which is from a brand called What We Do With Secret which is connected to a lab on fire. Hands down I would go with Monoscent G from uh, the house of What We Do With Secret which is a sub brand from a lab on fire. Why? So for me, I like both of them, right? Uh, for me, Initial Parfums Magnetic Blend is a lot drier and powderier, whereas what we do is secret 
is, you know, what we do is secret uh, mono scent. G is a lot syrupier and not as dry as uh, Magnetic Blend 7 is. So instantly I would go with that one because for me, mono scent G has a lot more lingering power and clinging power than Magnetic Blend 7 does because I have dry skin, powdery fragrances fizzle away faster than sticky fragrances, which I experience stickiness from the mono scent G. That's what I think, but that's just me. You might want to test and uh, compare and see, but I really like also what we do is Secret's price in comparison to uh, Initio Parfum's uh, Magnetic Blend 7. Much, much uh, more expensive here, uh, but both of them are definitely on the clean side and definitely kind of sexy musky. I would say kind of uh, replicating the smell of authentic deer musk, but uh, what they have here in Monoscent G is Galaxolide, which is this really beautiful note that's used in perfumery. It's a synthetic, but it smells like authentic deer musk. So for me, again, I would hands down go with Monoscent G because I just really love it and it smells fantastic. And I also use it to boost other fragrances. Whereas with Initio Parfums Magnetic Blend 7, I haven't really done the a lot of layering with it, although they recommend it. That's what the Magnetic Collection is, Magnetic, magnetic Blend Collection is. It's made to boost or enhance other fragrances. So you would lay this down and then spray some of the other fragrance on and that's exactly what you do. And I would do it with the Galaxolide uh, version of Monoscent G as well because I really think the fragrance itself is re really great as an intimate fragrance on its own but it's also a great booster, enhancer, primer for other fragrances. Just really love the smell. For me, it's like an authentic deer musk, but very intimate, very personal, not overly animalic, but has some light musky animalic accords and touches there. And I, I really think it's a great fragrance. So, so if I were you, go with this, uh, if you can find it. Uh, uh, although I feel like Magnetic Blend 7 might be at discounters because the brand does end up at discounters. This fragrance, uh, Mono Scent G, will not be at discounters. These are very uh, small distributed uh, brands, so it's hardly going to be ending up there. But um, I'm going to recommend a few other fragrances. Uh, I always recommend this one. It's Kiehl's Original Musk. It's uh, definitely... Uh, what I was re reading was Kiehl's Original Musk uses Galaxolide in, in the notes to create that kind of musk. But uh, Francisca was mentioning floral musks. This is definitely a floral musk. It definitely has flowers in there. There's orange blossom, there's ylang ylang, there's neroli, so it's definitely kind of a floral musk. And it also has a very authentic deer musk smell. It might just come off a bit light, but this fragrance is so easy to get. Any department not departments, where any mall or shopping center that you guys might be next to might have a Kiehl's, uh, you know, store and you can go in there and get it for like 45, 50 bucks for a 50 ml, so it's easy. But a lot of you guys complained it's either overly animalic or also very light, short-lived. You can use these two to layer with because in, as, in the end, as I said, I've read that um, they use Galaxolide in Kiehl's Original Musk. It's, it's like a um, synthetic musk. So you can prime it or boost it with Monoscent G, spray that on, let it dry, and then spray the Kiehl's Original Musk on. But I have a few more suggestions. I'm gonna go into a completely other direction here. Going back to Initio Parfums, how about musk therapy for kind of a fruity musk, very clean musk and perfect summer musk? It's got citrusy, this is, uh, this is rehab actually, it's not musk therapy, but for me it's got fruitiness, it's got citrus touches, and a very, very clean, very clean musk with white sandalwood, which is a kind of a creamy undertone there, and of course white musk, and they say pink musk, what the heck is pink musk? Just some kind of marketing <laughs> lingo, but for me, musk therapy is fantastic, I really love wearing it in the heat. It has good longevity, very close to the skin though, it's not a screamer, it's just a really beautiful fragrance. So musk therapy is definitely a great recommendation for you if you like it to be a little on the fruity side but definitely clean and floral. A uh, silver musk from Nasamato is another one, an Italian house. Uh, it's uh, once again kind of a clean, very lightly metallic a kind of a musk. Uh, it has very laundry-like uh, touches for me, for sure. And uh, I feel like it's uh, going to be a perfect, you know, fragrance for someone that's looking for a clean musk, subtle musk, personal musk non-complex musk. I don't have the fragrance with me. Musk Invisible from the House of Juliet has a gun. I feel like is a great, great, uh, you know, 
option. It's musk with cotton flower and jasmine. In the end, it's basically a very powdery kind of baby powder, milk powder kind of musk. So it has lots of powdery touches and also very, very clean. But in the end, it has some uh, light, uh, animalic light muskiness there as well, which is super fantastic and also not very, very expensive. And then we've got Claire de Musk. This is one of two musks in this house. Musk Kublai Khan is very animalic. I'm not recommending that because uh, this is not what Francisco was asking for. This is definitely going to do fine. If you like the idea of the uh, Monocent G or the Magnetic Blend 7, this is definitely one for you to try. It's got musk, iris, neroleum, bergamot, and it's definitely not animalic, but still has those kind of like musky, deer musk, authentic smells there. So Claire de Musk is great. And then finally, this cheapy that you're going to probably find at a lot of stores, very, very inexpensive, a unisex offering. It's from Elisa Ashley. It's just musk right here. I think it's a simple fragrance with the flowers. There's definitely floral notes here. And in the end, it's musk with tonka, iris, ylang ylang, jasmine, bergamot, and oak moss. And I feel like it's perfect, cozy, inexpensive musk. You can sleep with it like as a bed scent. You can overspray it. It's so inexpensive. Uh, and then also, you know, use their other products like lotions and things like that to enhance the fragrance. I feel like these also uh, layer really finely with uh, Monocent G. Uh, if you are interested in boosting uh, a fragrance, definitely you could do that. But anyway, those are my suggestions and hopefully it answers your question, Francisca. And what do you guys think? Is there any other recommendations for Francisca? And what are your thoughts on Monocent G from the House of What We Do Is Secret and Magnetic Blend uh, 7 from the House of Initial Parfums? Let me know, put some comments down so I can find out. All right, on to question number eight. Hello, great channel. How is perfume price derived? The same perfumer, Alberto Morias, made Versace Per Homme and Initio Blessed Baraka, but price for 100 ml, nearly $300 different. How? Why? Thank you for your time. Blessings, Kevin. So this is an interesting question and I do notice this quite a bit. I buy a lot of fragrances and notice that fragrances that are with designers are less expensive than the fragrances for the niche houses. So for me, if this is true, this is what I think is happening. Designers are not using the most expensive ingredients compared to the niche houses. This could be one of the reasons. And I feel like the perfumer that's creating the fragrances knows uh, you know, where to get their supplies or how much their ingredients cost because Alberto Morias works for Furmanish and he probably has, most likely, not probably, most likely has access to ingredients in different price ranges. So if Versace is going to make a $100 fragrance and Initio Parfums is going to make a $375 fragrance because I think their fragrances are around 350, 375 now and they're also 90 ml not 100 ml. So he's going to say okay this has a budget of this I'm going to go with the most expensive things or uh, moderately priced things and if I'm going to go with uh, Versace I'm going to use ingredients that are less expensive so that we can't we don't you know, we can't charge the fragrance more more or higher. For example, Versace also has their luxury collection, which I'm not 100% a fan of. Uh, most likely that same perfumer, if he's creating a perfume for their signature line compared to their higher end collection, he's gonna use the higher end ingredients, the more expensive ing ingredients in comparison to the, the cheaper, less expensive ingredients uh, to put compose the fragrance. So. Most of the time this is true. I think, um, personally, I, I, I can notice the differences, uh, you know. Uh, it's really, really prominent, and especially if you go down to a really, really uh, cheap house, inexpensive house that's known for selling like $20 fragrances and things like that, you can totally notice the difference, but still, sometimes the fragrances do smell great even though they don't smell as, as expensive, so the, the, those are fine that way, but most likely this particular scenario is because Initio Parfums has a bigger bigger budget for a fragrance and sells their fragrances for more expensive and they are you know capable of using the higher priced ingredients or notes and uh, you know things that go into creating a fragrance versus where you know a suggested retail price of a designer fragrance is around a hundred dollars then they're limited to a certain price point of ingredients and things like that so this could be one of the things but 
maybe the brands, uh, the, the, the niche houses uh, don't use the higher ingredients, but still, you know, charge uh, much more for the fragrances. I'm not a, I can't say that is true and that's not happening. It most likely does happen. Uh, also, I think, um, Initial Parfums has probably more packaging that goes into the creation of their fragrances, whereas a signature line fragrance from a designer is basically in a cardboard box versus with uh, Initial Parfums, they do have a higher and, uh, you know, a presentation with boxes and containers and things like that, so they have to pay more for those as well, which goes into the price point of actual fragrances. So it's not just the ingredients, it's also the presentation. And sometimes I think big presentation is way too much overdone and it can get overwhelming because I just want the juice in the end. Although I do enjoy presentation, don't get me wrong, I love seeing really beautifully done presentation. Sometimes, you know, brands like Zerjoff or uh, Fragrance Dubois, their presentation is over the top and I think we're paying for that if we're buying those fragrances because they're paying for it and they're charging us and we have to pay for it. But so I feel like it's not necessarily just the ingredients, but it is, but also what goes into the presentation and things like that. And with the designers, most likely they have a very limited budget because they're most likely paying a spokesperson, a spokesmodel, a celebrity to basically be the spokesperson for their fragrance. So they have that budget to deal with as well. So are we basically stuck with the cheapest ingredients for designers and more expensive ingredients for the niche houses? I'm not 100% sure, but you can kind of tell. Like this question that came up from uh, Kevin, I'm going to read it again. Why? Why, how is perfume price derived? The same perfumer made Versace Pour Homme and Initio Blessed Baraka, but price for 100 ml nearly $300, $300 different. How and why? And can you tell the difference between the quality of the ingredients in Initio Parfums versus the quality of the ingredients in, um, uh, you know, a Versace fragrance? I can totally tell and I, I, can, I can totally tell because you can smell they're not as, um, for me, designer fragrances lately have become synthetic smelling. So if they're not going to use the authentic real ingredients and they're going to replace the, you know, the authentic real ingredients that you find in nature with synthetic stuff, you can totally tell. And a lot of designer fragrances can end up smelling synthetic, which is really disappointing. Also, they add a lot of synthetic notes like amber woods and uh, things like that. The, the whole fragrance just becomes kind of like a synthetic mess basically. So you you can totally tell once you put your nose on a lot of different fragrances, the expensive ones and the cheap ones, side by side, you can totally tell. I think the best way for you to discover and learn the differences is find a fragrance that is a similar style versus the a cheap version of it and then an expensive uh, version of that similar style of fragrance and start kind of picking out the notes inside the, the fragrances and see if you can tell this bottle of uh, blah blah uses very expensive bergamot this bottle of blah blah is using cheap synthetic version of bergamot kind of a thing so anyway hopefully that answers your question uh, about this and uh, what do you guys think about this particular topic let me know put a comment down there could be other variants that go into uh, you know this uh, particular scenario but uh, most likely it's uh, cheap ingredients versus expensive ingredients and also the presentation that goes into a more expensive fragrance with their boxes and packing and things like that. Okay, this next question came to me a couple of different times and I put it off for this video. Hi Sebastian, I enjoy your YouTube videos and since you're one of the most credible fragrance experts, I'd like you to take a look at this vintage Terry Mugler Angel Men set and help me determine how old it is and what would be the value of something like this. My guess is the early 2000s or late 90s since Angel Men changed its name to Amen in the early 2000s, if I'm not mistaken can't wait to hear from you. So I feel great to be asked this particular question because I am a big fan of the original Angel Men, uh, which I wore so many bottles of. In fact, I was giving it as gifts to dad, sister's husband, mom, not mom, but brother. So many people I gave uh, Amen uh, or Angel Men as gifts. It was one of my all-time favorites because I loved its longevity and things like that. So it has been butchered now. It's kind of gotten watered down, but at that time when it launched in 96, 
I think it was a fantastic fragrance. I first discovered it in 97. I was waiting anxiously for it to launch in the States. So I've got photos from um, this uh, person, uh, and I forgot his name, uh, and I'm going to look at them. So it's a big gift set of Amen or Angel Men, because it used to be called Angel Men. I'm going to flash photos here. And it comes with an eau de toilette, 50 ml. It comes with shampoo, 100 ml. And it comes with a deodorant stick, uh, which is, uh, I don't know what size that is. But I actually have bought kits like this, but more flat with uh, the fragrance and the deodorant and the shampoo. In fact, I remember the shampoo myself. I have used it back in the late 90s and I, I love that stuff because, you know, showering and then, uh, you know, deodorizing and then spritzing that stuff. And the Angel Men used to last for days. I mean, it was really, really potent. So I did a little check on the batch code on the bottom of the bottle of this particular fragrance that um, this person has uh, sent images of. And I looked it up on Check Fresh. And the, the code, the batch code is 601511. So Check Fresh says uh, production date 2016-01 expiration date 2021-01 the age seven years one month six days shelf life five years notes the batch codes are repeated every 10 years so that is a key here it is repeated every 10 years and it says production date 2016-01 i don't know exactly what month angel men launched in france but it launched in 1996. So this, this says 2016. So rewind 10 years. It's, a, it's repeated every 10 years. It's 2006. And then rewind another 10 years. It's 1996, the year Angel Men launch. So I'm assuming this particular package was manufactured sometime in 1996. I'm not 100% sure what month, but it probably launched for the holidays. Could be, I don't know. But according to Check Fresh, this is what it says. And uh, it's, it's a pretty nice kit because it's in perfect condition. And I'm hoping that the fragrance itself smells great because I have a bottle, a 50 ml bottle of Angel Man and it smells super fantastic still. Uh, I can totally get the coffiness in there and it smells wonderful. I really, really love it. So if it is launched in 1996, because Angel Men became Amen, I believe sometime in the early 2000s. I could think it's somewhere around 2001, uh, a little after that, just before B-Men launched, because between Amen, they launched Cologne, which was a unisex fragrance. And then after Cologne, I, I'm not keeping up with the women's fragrances because there's so many flankers for Angel and Angel Innocent and all those that came out. But uh, between Amen or Angel Men in 96, Cologne in 2001, I think around there somewhere, Angel Men became Amen just before B-Men launched in 2004. I think B-Men launched in 2004 because I was a big fan of it. Loved that stuff. Wore so many bottles of it. So I think around then is when Angel Men became Amen. But this kit, according to Check Fresh, was manufactured in 1996. So what do you think this would be worth selling for? So I personally don't think the shampoo and the deodorant has a lot of value. I think it's the fragrance itself that has the better value. So I'm not sure if that will actually add any price to the actual value of the 50 ml bottle. For me, I think the 50 ml bottle can be sold for somewhere around $150, uh, give or take, uh, for a true, true fan. Uh, but a lot of people are cautious out there. I don't know what's, what platform I would use to sell this. Uh, I would use um, perhaps uh, eBay, but um, there's a lot of scamming going on, not only for people selling on eBay, but also the people buying. So I would use caution with this. Uh, if you have somebody near you that might want it, like if you have a local, like a Craigslist where you can sell things, or uh, here we have... Um, uh, there's a few other things, uh, resources we can use here in the States, but I think this person is from somewhere in East, Eastern Europe. So if you have some kind of a resource online where you can sell things, I would sell locally uh, if you're scared that somebody might take advantage of you and then you know lie and say this is a fake kind of a thing because that does happen. But according to Check Fresh, this is uh, you know from 1996, so it's a very, very uh, original batch of angel men. I, I feel like when they came out with the gift sets, they usually came out with uh, gift sets for the holidays. So most likely this was manufactured in the late summer because that's when they start putting out the gift sets to you know sell for the holidays. But then again, I think gift sets are sold 
almost all year round nowadays. I'm not 100% sure, but this is definitely according to Check Fresh from 1996. So you might have something really good on your hands. Check everything out, smell the fragrance itself, smell the, 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 the shampoo, smell the deodorant. Are they still the same? Because I'm not 100% sure how the, the actual shampoos and soaps and uh, deodorants last. Do they lose their power? I don't usually buy those myself. I'm more into the fragrances. And this particular fragrance I think should last because it's the kind of notes that doesn't have a lot of citruses and those are the notes that we have to watch for when we're buying vintage. The top notes usually kind of dies down and uh, turns kind of moldy, not really pleasant smelling, you know, like how citruses turn in your house. If you have a bowl of citruses and they kind of go bad, uh, for me, the citruses up top do go bad in fragrances that are older, especially if they're not stored well, they're like, you know, 10, 20 years old, that, that will turn fast. So the angel men or amen doesn't have a lot of citrusy notes up top. So I feel like they're not fragile notes. It's a very beefy, robust fragrance. And I think the smell itself should be good. But according to Check Fresh, it's from 1996. So you've got a pretty nice, uh, vintage on your hands. Good luck with selling it or keep it for yourself because I think it's a great fragrance. If I had a bottle of that, I would use it because I have one bottle right now. I'm storing it. But if I get another vintage, I would totally use it. But anyway, hopefully that answers your question. So question number 10. Hello, Sebastian. I hope you're doing well. I have a question for you. I purchased a Chanel less exclusive 200 ml off eBay and the perfume was leaking around the flang on the top. The flange on the top. I pushed it down and it stopped leaking. It smells great, but I didn't know if I should go ahead and keep it or try and send it back. What would you do? I did get it way less than retail price. So yeah, I've gotten fragrances that had been kind of off, like the sprayer's off, something's not working with the actual place where the sprayer is, but you put it into position and it starts working fine, but it had leaked a little and things like that. Now, if it was a place like FragranceNet or a department store that I ordered it from, I would definitely return it. But if it's an eBay sale, a purchase, if you got it working, I would just go with it. Uh, it's so complicated to do returns with people selling their things online. So I don't know if this is a store on eBay or if it's an individual selling the fragrance. I would think if it's working, just go with it and use it and don't deal with all the complications involved with, you know, reaching out to the person or the store on eBay, asking them to return it. Do they have another bottle? Uh, then you, you're gonna be stuck not getting the bottle replaced and things like that. So it just is a very, very complicated process. For me, if it was sold from a department store or somewhere that you know you can return and they have a really, uh, large uh, collection of a like a backlog of the fragrances then I would go for it I would actually contact the the store and say this was leaky kind of please uh, take it back or replace it kind of a thing but with eBay I, I would just go with the fragrance that you you know you received especially if you've got it working again so that's what I would do uh, I don't have a lot of time to kind of go back and forth with eBay and the the requirements for them to replace things only only times I do it if it's like broken or there's something wrong with it or if I received the wrong item I definitely would have to reach out to them but if I got the product working again and it's working fine and it smells great it's a great fragrance I love it kind of a thing oh I don't bother with it because it takes too much of my time and I've got much more important things to do than go deal with customer service on eBay all right question number 11 comes from Linda I follow you regularly on the Perfume Guy channel and love and appreciate your reviews. I have been a fragrance obsessed person all my life. I'm desperately trying to obtain a bottle of YSL Baby Cat with no success. I have a trip scheduled in April to Edinburgh and Glasgow and I'm wondering if you can give me hints of where to go find it. I called Harrods today in Edinburgh and they are all sold out. I would like to get it sooner if I could. The second item is how much do you charge customers to come to your studio? I am on a search for a fragrance I purchased when I was a young girl with my mother on a trip to Key West, Florida called Lafitte's Lady. I think I detect vanilla, but there is another note that I do not know and I would love to find something very similar to it. I've tried hundreds of vials through Lucky Scent and Scent Split, but no luck yet. I have a tiny little bit in my old bottle and need somebody with a good nose to figure out what it is. I live in the LA area. However, have family in the Bay Area, so could combine a road trip. Thanks so much for your help. Sincerely, Linda. Okay, two questions in one. I'm gonna briefly talk about the second part of the question, but I'm gonna talk about mostly about Baby Cat and what's going on with it. So I was on a trip to 
London and Edinburgh in uh, December and early January and I found that uh, Baby Cat was uh, completely sold out everywhere that I went to. I went to Harrods several times, Selfridges several times, nowhere to be found and Harrods Beauty in Edinburgh also did not have it, it was sold out. While I was on this trip also there's a rumor flying around that Baby Cat was discontinued. I asked several of the associates that worked for YSL at these stores, they said, no, it's not sold out. I mean, I'm sorry, no, it's not discontinued. It's just sold out because it's really, really popular. So while I was at, on this trip, I looked around and I discovered that it made an appearance or it, you know, it um, was launched in Canada and then all of a sudden it was discontinued in Canada. So they brought it to Canada and it was discontinued. So I think people were hearing that it was discontinued, but it was only discontinued in Canada because I'm not understanding what YSL's marketing is doing or L'Oreal or whoever is doing this, but why would they launch it in Canada and remove it right away? Why would they not launch it in the USA and everybody has been wanting it here? And also, on the last couple of trips I've done to France, it was very hard to get a bottle of it there as well. And this is a brand new release. It just launched early last year, so I don't understand what's going on. Why are they making limited amounts? It's selling out really fast. And every time I'd go into a store that sells the brand, there's nowhere to be found. It's always gone. It's always missing. They tell me to go to other stores and things like that. So I'm going to be going back on a trip to France here in like three, four weeks. And I'm hoping I can find more bottles there to have a full answer for you guys. But according to the YSL associates at Selfridges and at Harrods, while I was in London said it's not discontinued it's just very very popular it would never be discontinued this they said it's too popular to discontinue but it's very very popular and it's constantly selling out so this fragrance has not premiered here in the States yet they've already premiered another fragrance that came out after this called Lavalier here in the states but baby cat has not launched here i personally don't think it's going to launch here if they've put it off this much and they've already launched it in canada and already discontinued it there they're never going to launch this here but i could uh, i could be completely wrong since they also like i said launched lavalier here and uh, baby cat is nowhere to be found so i'll find out for sure when i go on this trip to see how it is doing in france i frequently visit perfume shops or department stores there and look at fragrances and things and I'll see if I can get the full answer on this particular fragrance. Maybe if I can find a YSL boutique in there and go in and ask them there to see what the status is. But again, I don't understand why they're doing this and why not launching it in the USA when there's so many people that want this fragrance. There's so many people. I can't believe how many people message me about this baby cat. If you don't know about baby cat, it's basically vanilla. There's olivanum, so it's incense-y, it's smoky. There's also leather, there's resins here. There's a saffron and there's a pink pepper. So it's kind of a spicy, smoky, incense-y, resinous vanilla. So it uh, kind of dilutes this sweet, syrupy, vanillic touches uh, while contrasting with these kind of notes kind of a thing. It makes for uh, kind of a semi-sweet, uh, you know, gourmand fragrance, which has smoky touches and things like that. I quite like it. I really like it. And that's, I think a lot of people like it as well. And that's why it's, um, uh, it's completely selling out. Plus it has a very catchy name. Is that why you guys want this fragrance? Uh, those of you that want this fragrance that you can't get it have you even smelled it because if you haven't smelled it yet I've done a comparison out there there's already a fragrance out there that's similar to baby cat and also created by the same perfumer so he's basically copied himself and made baby cat after he created Vanna Gloria for Laboratorio Olfativo so Vanna Gloria by Laboratorio Olfativo is around 150 dollars for 100 ml this here is 100 ml baby cap for about $250. So this is much cheaper. I'll have a link in the info box. Uh, you can get a, a bottle yourself. But for me, they're very similar, very, very close, not identical. There are some differences though. So the, the perfumer has made them a little different, but in the end, it reminds me of one another. So if you are having a challenging time getting baby cat, why not 
just get a bottle of Vanna Gloria or buy samples of each and see and test and see which one you like better. Because recently I had somebody over to the studio and they compared both of them. They were having the same situation. They couldn't find a bottle and they wanted to come in for a consult and they, they didn't buy a sample of Vanna Gloria, obviously. So they came in and smelled both and they actually ended up liking uh, of this one, uh, Vanna Gloria over Baby Cat. So it'll be a matter of taste. But you got to enjoy vanilla for one and you also have to enjoy that kind of smoky, resinous, incense-y uh, uh, note uh, uh, to, to enjoy th this particular fragrance. There's also one other fragrance. I believe it's similar. It's the Amouage Vanilla um, Attar that uh, launched. Same perfumer. Again, Dominic Ropion created. Uh, I don't have that one myself, but I have smelled it and I do agree it's similar. And then also some people are, are mentioning Rosendo Matu number no. 5 is also similar. I didn't agree at first, but yes, I have kind of like tested them side by side. I do see similarities of the two as well. So in general, Rosendo Matu's number no. 5 uh, came out way before Vanna Gloria or Baby Cat did. So if you're a fan of these fragrances, I would get samples of all of them if you can and compare them and see which one you like better. But if for now, if you just want an alternative for Baby Cat and you can't get your hands on it, definitely try Vanna Gloria. As I said, I have a link in the info box. So the second part, yes, I do do consulting now. The studio is in, in process of becoming perfected. It's I've already uh, posted some photos. Basically, the shelving is going to be less cluttery soon. I think I'm going to take on that part of the project after I get back from Europe mid-April. But for now, it's kind of in a place where I can invite a lot more you know, clientele. Uh, and basically, I'll have a link in the info box for anybody that's interested. Uh, again, this is not a business I'm trying to do where I'm trying to like just constantly have people come in and go. It's I'm very selective with who comes in. I'm not taking on like five, six people a day, one every couple of weeks, uh, one every week or something. I'm not trying to like make tons of money doing this. It's just something that I like to do with some people that are really, really passionate about fragrances. And again, you might send a message and I might not reply. Uh, it it's my, might have to fit my schedule and things like that. So if you're interested in coming in, send an email to the email address that's there and then we can communicate and so on. Anyway, hopefully that answers your questions uh, and uh, let's move on to the next question. And then finally, question number 12. Hey Sebastian, really love your videos and I'm so happy you are going to start making the, your questions answered videos. I really would love it if you would answer this question on the rice fragrances. Can you tell us what they smell like and also give us multiple suggestions? That would be great. I will send you more questions for later videos, but I would really love to find out about this topic very soon. I love the idea of rice and perfumes and powdery perfumes intrigue me. Thank you so much for doing what you do and answering this question. So rice perfumes, are you a fan of this particular note in fragrances? It turns out I have several in the library here that I have uh, fragrances that feature this note. For me, rice definitely adds a powderiness. It's kind of associated with, for me, I get a powdered milk reaction to it. So there's a light lactonic undertone about it, a bit of nuttiness about it as well, and very, very powdery. Rice powder is something that I think my family uses, my mom uses very sparingly in certain things, and I remember smelling it. But the other thing I like about rice is like, I. I make rice. I make Middle Eastern rice all the time and I absolutely love it. And I make it with vermicelli and it's with chicken broth. And sometimes I use a rice cooker, which is basically plain, but when you've ever made rice, either the way I make it on the stovetop or in a rice cooker, when you open it up after it's done, that steam, that smell is exactly what rice is, is supposed to smell like in fragrances and I absolutely love it. It's kind of... Um, earthy, a bit grassy, and of course a lightly nutty, but there's a very distinct smell that kind of is associated with powderiness as well. Really fantastic note, not, not many fragrances feature it, but I'm going to share with you several fragrances uh, that feature rice as a note, and we're going to start off with the least ricey fragrances and move on to the riciest, at least for me, that's how I experience them. First fragrance we're going to talk about is Eta Libre de Orange's True Lust. This does feature rice as a note. 
and also leather, violet, rum, coconut, rose, osmanthus, ylang ylang, sandalwood, ambergris. So for me, it's mostly a violet leather fragrance, a bit makeup-y, but there's definitely that addition of rice to give you like a makeup powder effect in this particular fragrance. So it's Etat Libre de Orange. It's a unique fragrance from them. It's a bit sexy. There's a bit of an undertone of sweatiness here, and it smells super fantastic. All right, next fragrance I'm going to talk to you about. Again, we're going to graduate towards the most riciest or the rice fragrances. This is Floraiku One Umbrella for Two. It's mostly a gourmand. It features uh, notes that are kind of gourmand for me, but a bit spicy, a bit smoky, and definitely fruity as well with blackcurrant, genma chai tea, cedarwood, white musk, cyclamen, puffed rice, tea accord, blackcurrant bud. For me, it's not about the rice. Both of these fragrances, the True Lust and also the Floraiko, uh, Floraiku One Umbrella for Two are not about rice, but they definitely have a, you know, there's a presence there with the two uh, the fragrances. You can definitely experience it, but with uh, the Floraiku, you can experience it more than you can experience it with the uh, uh, True Lust. But here, it adds a kind of a puffy, powdery touch to the fragrance and a light smokiness and an of course a little nuttiness as well. I think it's a really great fragrance. I never talk about this brand but this is a really delicious fragrance. Anybody a fan of this one? I like the whole really gourmand cookies and uh, fruity kind of uh, tea service kind of uh, experience that you get with one umbrella for two. And I always forget about it but it's really delicious fragrance. Moving on to the house of I Profumi di Frenze. It's Frangipani e Coco. This one right here. This is a, another fragrance that utilizes rice but not necessarily as big as the ones we're going to get to up at the front of the, the video. But definitely there's a rice presence here, but it features frangipani with coconut, rice, oranges, white flowers, olibanum, patchouli, amber, and geranium. But it's a fragrance called frangipani e coco, the frangipani flower, which is tropical, with coconut, which is also tropical. The rice pretty much for me adds powderiness here, but eventually you also have flowers. There's white flowers, there's citruses, light smokiness from olibanum, a bit earthy patchouli and amber, and some aromatics from um, the geranium note, which lightly has a little bit of a rosy mintiness there. So this is Frangipani Ikoko, the third fragrance. Uh, this next one might be a little tough to get, but this is a great rice fragrance. I'm putting it here at number four. It's a bit simplistic, but definitely it's a rice balm. This is Riso from the house of Tutto Tondo. Those of you that are in Italy, you'll have a really easy time getting this. This is probably like 45 euros. It's definitely very ricey. It's got rice, vanilla, musk, amber. The combination is great. It's fresh, it's bright, powdery, a bit nutty, and then also a little bit, uh, you know, grassy and earthy and powdery for sure. The, the rice is really distinct in this one, but I like it because there's a very unique, distinct rice smell that light nuttiness and grassiness is there but also a bit like milkiness also like this milkiness comes in but not necessarily like creamy more like powdered milk touch with the the riciness of this particular fragrance a very very great fragrance and it's really inexpensive for 45 or something euros uh, for 100 ml i think it's totally worth it and a very unique wearing experience with the rice notes so this is tutto tonto riso uh, let me know if you know that brand put a comment down so I can find out. So up next is a new house called Born to Stand Out and this is Dirty Rice, this one right here. And this one totally is rice in your face. It's rice and musk for me and lots of powder and it's basically imagine that steamy rice experience I was mentioning when you open up a brand new you know pot of rice or uh, you know a rice cooker and things like that. It's like the steam, that smell with the steam, it's basically here but there's a lot more stuff happening here. Definitely loads of basmati rice and I love this kind of rice. It's my favorite kind of rice to cook with. Uh, I love the smell of it uh, especially like I said after it's steaming in the cooker or the rice cooker. But lots of musk here. There's some earthiness from vetiver. There's cetalox, which is kind of like the cousin of uh, ambroxan, so it, it kind of makes the fragrance linger on longer. But it's got cedar, there's milk, peony, sandalwood, almonds, so a bit nuttiness. And I think that milk really does contribute to making the basmati rice come out with more of its milky touches that I've been mentioning. Because there's something like a 
undertone of uh, powdered milkiness with basmati rice but they've actually added the actual milk note in here to give it a bit of a creaminess but very unique fragrance a bit subdued but uh, I think it's definitely worth trying especially if you like the idea of rice and fragrance this is uh, born to stand out dirty rice uh, this next fragrance is an Alberto Moria's created fragrance it's L'Artisan Parfumeur's Le Chant de Camargue uh, I've actually been to the Camargue in France in the south of France very interesting place with flamingos of all things. I've seen flamingos down there. This features notes of French rice, sandalwood milk, and bergamot. So once again, but the rice is like in your face, very powdery, and also uh, they're, they're adding sandalwood milk here. And I think I've always mentioned sandalwood is kind of milky lactonic. So I feel like sandalwood really, really, you know, like does really great meshed with the French rice. The rice is powdery, a bit nutty, as I said, a little gray grassiness there, that kind of light uh, uh, powdered milkiness that's also prominent when you're steaming the rice or cooking the rice. And it just really con complements the sandalwood milk that's in here. They work really wonderfully together. It kind of creates a powdery touch, not necessarily going towards the uh, powdered, uh, you know, make a powder effect, more like powdered milk for me, for sure, with a bit of tartness under there with the bergamot. Very unique fragrance. Definitely, if you like the idea of powder, definitely try Le Chant de Camargue from L'Artisan Parfumer. And this next one, I think it has to be here. This is Santal Basmati, this one right here from Affinescence. This is sandalwood and a creamy sandalwood. And we're talking about sandalwood in the last fragrance. Here we have sandalwood in your face, but also with basmati rice, cashmere, iris, and patchouli. This is a fantastic fragrance. Very cozy, very woody, very milky, very powdery. And uh, really love, love, love uh, basmati rice and the way it smells after it's cooked. Here it's captured with sandalwood. And it's a very milky, creamy sandalwood and definitely very cozy to wear uh, around the house or go out with. So this is Santal Basmati from Affinescence. And then my favorite rice fragrance, I would say, is uh, Teo Cabanel's Je ne sais quoi. This is so delicious. I think it's not all about rice because there's other things happening here, but rice is really in your face with this one. So rice, powdery with matcha, matcha tea, it's mate, sandalwood, tolu balsam, gayak wood, Haitian vetiver, violet leaves. What a great combination. This stuff works so well together. It's powdery, it's green, it's tea. It's kind of like that the powdered milk thing with the rice. There's the mate here. It's earthy. It's green, but it's got uh, balsamic touches and woody touches and earthy touches and of course some ozonics thrown in. I think this is probably one of the best fragrances from this house. Really smells fantastic and definitely does a great job with featuring rice as a note here. This is Je ne sais quoi from Teo Cabanel. And that, that's the last rice fragrance I'm gonna recommend. I highly recommend the last four rice fragrances I talked about if you want full in-your-face rice um, experiences. Je ne sais quoi, La Chante de Camargue, uh, Dirty Rice, I should say five. Uh, then uh, also Santal Basmati and also Riso. The last five uh, rice fragrances are definitely the riciest. Anyway, I hope that answers your question for rice fragrances, both of you that messaged me. Thank you so much. And that wraps up this video of, of uh, your fragrance questions answered. If you want to send me questions, they have there's a link in the info box. Basically, it's lfsgquestions at gmail.com. I can't get to every one of your questions, unfortunately. And if you've sent me a question and I haven't written back to you or done a video on it, please send it again. There's a lot of spamming going on like scamming as I was mentioning early on so I can't help a lot of this scammy spamminess that's going on but if you have sent me a question and I haven't answered I might have missed it it might have gone into spam it might have gotten accidentally deleted or I just forgot about it I apologize send it again as I'm going to continue doing these videos as long as I can get them prepped which takes a long time to prep and get all the fragrances going but uh, as I said also stay tuned for these videos to be individually launched as their own individual videos that will happen very soon but other than that guys thanks so much for watching don't forget to send me questions please like this video please share it follow me on instagram and facebook and i'll be back with more videos very soon have a good one goodbye